Okay, now for uh, something a little bit different. So um, I'm Matt Haynes, and uh, I lead the uh, cloud groups at Time Warner Cable. With me is Jason Rural. He leads the OpenStack team. Uh, you've been hearing from his team several times this summit uh, talking about how we did OpenStack at Time Warner Cable and some of our challenges and successes. Um, what we thought would be interesting, uh, and largely for, our, for hopefully an audience of folks who are trying to look at OpenStack for enterprise use, is talking about the culture of your company and what, what installing OpenStack into that culture possibly does. And then things you can do to maybe make that transition go a little better. So, uh, so what we'll do is introduce a little bit, just really high level, uh, the the OpenStack project for Time Warner Cable, why we did it, and, and kind of where we are with that. And, and again, I'm going to be really brief with that. Um, if you missed the technical talks that, uh, that Jason's team has been doing, they're all online somewhere uh, that you can go look at them. I, I encourage it. It uh, really gets into the details, as I said, uh, and it's probably important to make this caveat. At a technical conference, this is not a technical talk. Um, so, um, so let's talk about the, the culture uh, at Time Warner Cable, but let's start with a little bit of where we are. So um, we started um, uh, not too long ago um, to, to stand up OpenStack at Time Warner Cable. And um, we, uh, Jason's team spent about six months from, you know, uh, whiteboard drawings to a production cloud up and running. Uh, and that was a you know, phenomenally fast stand up with some of the operational requirements that we gave them uh, for, for what I call enterprise OpenStack. And that was, I wanted a version of OpenStack that, you know, look, we all, we all like to, we all know the cattle and, and pet model. And we like to think that all of our customers are gonna be these sort of you know, brutal cattle folks who, who, who have elastic applications and they spin up and destroy VMs, you know, on demand all the time. And the reality is if you're doing this inside of an enterprise that's existed for a while, and especially inside of an enterprise as, as fresh and new as the cable companies, um, you, you, you need to be ready to, to support a certain kind of application. Uh, and that's the application that assumes the VM really isn't going to die. Uh, and that it's going to stay around for a while, and they do give them names, and they really are upset when you kill them. So, you know, there's a blend that's at work here, and I think it's really important when you do this for a company that you, you kind of understand what you're getting into and not just go with a uh, sort of a, a, you know, a certain you know, open stack level. It's going to be this one, you know, way where everyone kills and destroys VMs and, and, and does you know, horizontal scale and all that, but, but really we could take pretty much an off-the-shelf application that expects the VM to live and, and have a high success that it'll live in our environment. So for enterprise OpenStack, you know, the, 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 the big things that had to show up, uh, we needed a geo-redundant footprint. Um, it, it, we have it in two data centers in our two of our national data centers in the country. Um, object storage is shared across, is, is replicated across. Um, our, our identity is global. Um, and we, we, you know, the biggest thing, and it's come up in our Ceph talk and some of other talks, is live migration. Um, I don't think it's a commonly used feature in op operators um, within OpenStack. But uh, for us, it's very important, and it lets us nine times out of 10 preserve a VM that we would otherwise have to kill for a reboot or any, any other kind of event. Uh, we can often do a, a, an evacuation of that VM and, uh, and, and save that pet's life for one more day. Um, so with those enterprise OpenStack uh, requirements, the team uh, was up and running in about six months at that, at that mid-year uh, mark last year. Uh, so a really impressive, um, a really impressive feat um, for anybody who's done OpenStack at scale. Um, so, so in the last six months, in the six months between uh, the mid last year to the end of the year, it was really about maturing the platform. Um, there were a lot of, while we were up and running with these features, there was still a lot of operational maturity going on. There was a lot of uh, making sure that, that, that the team could operate. We were bringing on new teams. So there was just a lot of overall maturity that was happening. Uh, and we were also working on cu the customer story. 
Uh, and, and part of what we're talking about today here is, is, is how you go get those customers sometimes and how you get them over this cultural gap that you're going to face. Um, so Jason's going to get into a lot of the details for that. Um, but, uh, but then now from, from the beginning of the year till, till the middle of this year, it's really been about expanding this platform. We've, we've put a new underlay network architecture in place. We've added a new national data center uh, that, that Time Warner Cable has expanded into. So there's a lot of expansion efforts now. We're adding more services. Uh, there, was a, there was a designate talk here earlier today. Uh, f from Time Warner Cable, so so this is kind of where we are in our in our path, um, and um, it, it's going really well. Um, why did we do it, right? Why did we why did we do OpenStack, and and why did Time Warner Cable actually do the broad cloud initiative that that I was brought in for uh, uh, for the company? Uh, and it really came down to these three propositions. Um, the first one really is about making sure that your development community, the customers for us, can move faster. Um, this is really about giving uh, folks a programmatic on-demand infrastructure that they can start to use automation. And to the extent that they want to start to develop a DevOps model and, and build applications that way, um, they actually have the support from the underlying infrastructure at the company that they need. Um, you heard earlier we are supporting now a lot of uh, what we might call the over-the-top video platforms. Uh, we write clients for iPhones and tablets and Roku boxes, and the change of pace that those run at is very fast. So we really did need to be faster for our developer community. Um, cost is always a big thing. Um, you know, the cable companies, I know uh, I was a little surprised with how much money we spent uh, coming in. Um, and uh, so it wasn't surprising to me that one of the mandates that was given to me was, let's bring those costs down. Um, it, it should be able to run infrastructure at lower costs. Um, OpenStack, in particular, as one of the big tools in our cloud arsenal, gives us a capability of not just because it's open source, um, that, you know, that, that can be a bit of a fallacy sometimes because you still have to hire people and sometimes you have support licenses and so forth, but, but because it, it is a, you know, is a pure software uh, level you know, infrastructure for us and allows us to, to create a commodity hardware platform under the covers, the hardware we do buy now looks much more generic. It looks common across multiple vendor sets. I can get these vendors beating each other up sometimes, and, and uh, I know they always appreciate that. Um, and then finally, um, it, was important as, uh, it was important for us to be able to build this in a way that created a reliable footprint for applications. Um, we, we had in the past in the company um, lots of data centers, lots of, we're not, sh we're not shy for data centers, we're not shy for network pipes, we're not shy for for most infrastructure, but, but nobody ever took the time for developer, on behalf of developers, to put together infrastructure in a way that, that, that HA and DR kind of features just came with it. Um, and as a result, the applications that support our video, broadband, and phone services that run across the company ran with different levels of reliability for those, those major events. So our job was to, to smooth that out a bit and create some consistency in the way we provide HA and DR support to our applications. So that's what we're here to do. Uh, and with that, we kind of stepped into a culture at Time Warner Cable that uh, I don't think is different than uh, a lot of telco, to be honest. Uh, but, um, but it was different than you know the folks you go grab off the street that often are using OpenStack, and they just were using AWS and something else. Um, th this is really where the mismatch is that we've seen um, and, and what we're going to get into today. So, you know, I like to say it's, it's sort of an operate over engineer culture often. Um, it, it, it's, it's hardware over software. If there's a solution that can be created, and, you know, if you can go buy an appliance to do something, then let's do that. Um, as opposed to actually creating some software on top of something more generic. Um, the, the culture was very much vendors over open source. Um, uh, it's, it's a very, it was, a, you know, it was and remains a very vendor uh, friendly community and what we're, not, we're not trying to be unfriendly to our vendors, but we are trying to, to bring in this notion that open source is an important uh, part of the mix. 
Um, I think all this kind of comes down to, you know, for me, what it felt like was, it was a culture that was built around stability um, over speed. And, and, uh, and so there were a lot of things in the company and the way it operates in the processes that create slowness uh, for the sake of stability. And, 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 the, and the interesting thing, and I don't think I have to sell that here, is that's a bit of a, that's a, bit of a f an illusion, right? Um, and I think what most people realize is speed is stability. Um, and so that's one of the big things we're trying to get uh, across. So, um, so with that, that's the intro. Uh, that's about all I wanted to speak today. So um, I'm going to hand off to Jason here, and he's going to he's going to kind of take you through some of the things and the shifts that we've done. And and I do want to indicate, you know, we're kind of almost seeing. Hopefully, this is like a two man panel, and I'm hoping you out there are, maybe have a question about your company. And we're, we really don't have 40 minutes worth of talk, so uh, so please come up and ask us questions. All right, great. Uh, technologist gets to talk culture. This is going to be fun. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, no, actually, there's a lot of cultural changes that we've undergone and are still undergoing um, with the rollout of OpenStack, both within the OpenStack team as well, and, and what's more interesting, just across the company. And I'm going to focus on three of them today. The first one is, related, is tied to application migration. Um, then we'll talk about DevOps transformation, and then we'll get into some of the tooling. If we, if we look at the application migration, this one's kind of interesting because um, we have a lot of traditional applications that, that are migrating to the cloud, right? And, 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 there's, and there's also, let me back up and say, we also stick this cloud without a mandate that you, you have to move to it, okay? So there was no stick, right? So it's all carrot. And these are the carrots, um, the, the added values, right? So everything that we've been hearing about, um, about speed, agility, that type of thing, the, those, those are the carrots. But those carrots aren't, um, aren't well known from an, an attritional enterprise. So you have to get into a lot of education. You, there's a lot of concern about the, the, the reliability of the system. And so you need to demonstrate that it is reliable. Um, and then there's a trust transparency component. I'm going to go into these a little bit. Um, from an added value perspective, you know, I'm not going to talk about the self-service stuff, but we added some things into um, our specific deployment to actually help these non-cloud aware applications to come, to come um, and join the, uh, the cloud, right? So um, we have the geo-redundant um, object storage, which is great for disaster recovery, right? A, lo a lot of the systems, um, I wouldn't say a lot, but many of the systems in Time Warner Cable that are kind of just sitting in one data center um, and you know, we lose that, that data center, we'll lose that whole app, right? So having a geo-redundant data, uh, data store like this is very easy to, to, to do backups and they're automatically available in another region. Um, from the same perspective, we also set up multiple, multiple regions of, for our cloud, right? So you can, our customers can now have compute resources in both regions and they can do things like global load balancing between them and things like that to get, to get nice uh, HA. Um, so they start looking at this and they go, okay, that's cool. That, that, I can see value in wanting to move to that type of environment, right? Um, live migration I have listed on here because again, this is really, it's really an operator tool in my perspective. It really helps me do my job, my team do, do my job or do their job in that we can, we can easily um, upgrade the OS, um, do kernel patches and things like that. Um, but from a customer perspective, you know, if they have, if they have a, a um, application and it's only running on one instance, right, um, and it's a single point of fa failure, they can't, they can't deal with you having to reboot a box, right? And, and worst, worst of all, um, that reboot, in many cases, um, based upon when Time Warner likes to do maintenance in the middle of the night, um, requires them to be available in the middle of the night. It's like, Okay, that, that kind of that kind of sucks. So having the live migration capability kind of alleviates that problem for them, so they can kind of easier uh, it's easier for them to have these less cloudy applications in the environment. And then things like anti affinity for scheduling of their your your application your instances when they so that they can they can reside in in a fashion that they're not all on the same hypervisor. So we offer that capability. And then of course feature 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 right. There's tons of new features that we're adding in. Um, things that they're not getting in, in the other parts of the organization. So, um, you know, load balancing, DNS, monitoring, and so forth. Uh, education is, is actually key. Um, we have to do a lot of onboarding sessions 
people just they don't even know what you know, sometimes what virtualization is. We have a wide um, spectrum of customers. We have some that are fairly, fairly sophisticated um, and, and, and in what they do in their development teams, and we have others that you know they're looking for the form to fill out to ask for a specific type of instance, and they want to know the fax number where to fax it to, right? And 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 you know and they'll they come back to work three months later, and hopefully they haven't they have an instance, right? Um, so onboarding sessions were important. Meeting meeting with the small groups of businesses to explain uh, how to use the how, how to use this environment um, best for their type of applications, um, and then we did tailored training. Um, so there's a lot of you can get a lot of training on OpenStack from different vendors, um, third parties, um, but we actually wanted very tailored training because you can implement OpenStack in a thousand different ways in your environment. And we wanted our customers to learn how to use it in our environment. Like, how do we do block storage, right? How does, how does, how does, um, you know, how does our networking work? It's, it's very different, right? We use uh, um, Neutron with ML2 and VXLAN overlay, so it's a very different. Uh, so the tailored training sessions, those happen face to face, and now they're rolling out virtually across the whole organization. And th the users actually get accounts within our cloud in the production environment, and they can go and do labs and things like that. And we not only teach them how to actually just use the tools, but we also teach them how to actually build cloud-aware applications. And we, we introduce them to Puppet in Ansible, and like, hey, you know, this actually works on top of the cloud too, right? So they, they learn things like that, and FAQs and things like that. And then the last one is pretty important too. We have a lot of OpenStack experts within our team, and so we provide access to the to our, our team members um, to answer questions and, and help people along. Uh, transparency, this one was kind of interesting to me. So we have, we have some customers that actually owned the infrastructure in the past, kind of end to end, right? They, they, owned, they owned their machines and then they owned the, the uh, support and operations of it and then also the applications on it. And now, you know, they wanna move to infrastructure as a service and they feel like they're losing some control. Um, and you know they so they want to. There really needs to be this trust built up uh, between you know those teams and the teams running the infrastructure. And so we we've uh, tried to move towards that. And I think we've been fairly successful with transparency. So we've been doing things like provide dashboards. We provide health dashboards. We show the health of the system. We show the uptime. They can drill down and they can see if there are any events happening. They like that, right? So now if their application's not working, they can go look, well, is there a known issue in the environment? Um, we have deployment dashboards. We deploy weekly, sometimes multiple times a week. Um, and customers, um, some of our customers actually, they wanna know when those deploys are happening because we don't do them during the normal deployment or maintenance hours in the middle of the night. We actually do them during the middle of the day, which is another cultural shift. Um, we feel that you know, deploying more often and frequently is less risky and doing it during the day when you have engineering resources around to work on things, uh, if they should go awry, um, you're gonna experience less impact if there, if there is gonna be any. So we make dashboards available to let our customers know when we're doing deployments and when they're completing. Uh, we have incident dashboards for known, uh, publishing known problems, and things like that. And then uh, the last one is, is interesting is we're starting to introduce Showback. Um, actually letting our customers know what they're actually using and potentially the cost of it. Um, we think that this is what's going to, I, I mentioned earlier the stick and the carrot, this has all been about carrots, just you know, give them something cool and they'll start using it, um, but they will start exploiting it, right? Um, so this is where the showback is gonna come in handy. They're gonna actually really see um, what their true utilization is and their cost, um, and that rolls up to, to the VP level and is very useful in budget planning going forward. Uh, the, the next kind of cultural shift has to do with the DevOps transformation. So um, I, the application migration, kind of, it was kind of more like taking existing applications and, and, and figuring out how to get them onto the cloud. Um, the DevOps transformation though is, is more about some of the, the, the greenfield applications that we're, we're seeing um, being built on the cloud because um, Development is, the way people are developing applications is now changing because they're taking into account the cloud, right? So they're building cloud-aware applications, they're thinking about things like fail-fast deployments and things like that. Um, so everybody knows cloud-aware applications are very composable, extensible, they're elastic, they, can, they should be able to scale out and scale in, so they need to be somewhat stateless. Um, so 
we're, we're getting more and more of the customers building those applications, which is, which is awesome. That's what we want. Um, but, and uh, the, the interesting thing is that uh, if you build your CloudAware application correctly, like if you follow that last bullet, you make it able to tolerate a loss of a VM, right? If you build your application to be able to tolerate the loss of a VM and you scale it out horizontally, you can actually build a, a, a application that, that is pretty, pretty reliable. Um, maybe even more reliable than, you know, the uh, traditional enterprise applications that are on very high-end hardware where they're relying on all that availability from the hardware, right? So you can, you can get to the four nines, five nines. And so that's what we're seeing. We're seeing people start to take advantage of that, which is great. Um, and when you start building CloudAware applications like this, you, you actually need to start thinking about automation because if you want to deploy out horizontally and, and then scale back in, you need to do that in an automated fashion. And if you want to be able to um, recover or, or be fault tolerant, you need to be able to build things on the fly. So you're talking about really automating the uh, creation of your, uh, of your environment and the maintenance of it. So now you're getting into DevOps. So that's where this whole DevOps model takes into account. So, so now the application developers are actually thinking about operations, right? They're thinking about how is this going to be deployed? How is this going to be monitored so I know how to scale it out and scale it back? So we have teams now that are on our cloud that are really moving to full DevOps models, which is awesome. Um, and then with the, you know, as you move to the DevOps model and you have more automation, you're going to be able to have more rapid deployments. Traditionally, as, as Matt said, um, deployments in Time Warner Cable have been very methodical, very slow, very deliberate. Um, and so now with automation, you can really start thinking about, well, how can I deploy more often? Um, and, and how can I think about more fail-fast type of delivery mechanisms um, that, you know, if you, um, if you fail, then just, you know, deploy again, fix, deploy again, fix, deploy again. Um, and it's an iterative process. So that's, uh, all right. All right, third, third and foremost is the tools and processes. So um, we've introduced as an OpenStack team in, um, a lot of tooling for CI, CD, uh, and, and to get the automation for our cloud infrastructure in place. Um, this, this tooling now is, is starting to find its way into other parts of the Time Warner organization. And we've, uh, from a CICD perspective, as well as some of the, the processes we have in place for rolling things to production, um, and then also the use of the tools um, is, are now kind of ex are starting to be used outside of the cloud. So, and I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. I'm not going to describe our, our CID, CICD process flow. We've had presentations on that already. Um, but we do have um, quite a few tools that we use um, in conjunction to, to do, do, do CICD in our environment. And from an OpenStack cloud perspective, you know, we stay very close to upstream trunk. We're able to pull in, um, you know, contribute changes upstream, pull them in, you know, test them, deploy them very quickly. And we do that. Um, weekly, and this this same type of CI/CD tool chain now, um, we're we're starting to work with like our network, our physical networking teams, to introduce this to do change control and automation for the uh, switches in the network, um, in the physical network. So we're really excited about that, and then we also have other we also have other teams that are building applications on top of our cloud that are making use of the same CI/CD infrastructure. Uh, processes, I talked about tools, but processes and having one is actually important. So you can't just uh, randomly push uh, changes to production, so you need to have a process. In, in, our, um, in our environment, we actually have uh, this virtual development capability where we can develop our cloud on top of our cloud. Um, each developer can, can actually spin up a complete cloud, even with regional aspects. Um, and they can do their own development work and know that it works. Um, and then that gets submitted for, for review using kind of Git and Garrett capabilities and then merges to master, and then we can roll it out through staging and production and, and so on. Um, some of these mechanisms here and processes here now are also being used by other parts. We have a video application team 
now that is actually using the, our same uh, virtual development capability um, to do the development of the, the video application platform back in um, so they can rapidly spin up all their dev test environment um, on top of our cloud. All right, tools and processes. So what I, what I mean by this is um, there are a lot of things that, that were needed from a, a standpoint of how do you operate as a kind of a DevOps organization. Um, things like, you know, how are you going to communicate, how you can have a distributive team, you know, so being able to make use of like HipChat, Confluence, things like that, have Ansible and Garrett, or Ansible and, and Puppet and even Garrett um, publish uh, information within those channels so everybody knows what's going on at any, any time of day. Um, being able to have an uh, on-call schedule um, with escalation policies, um, things like that. And these tools now are per starting to permeate outside of the OpenStack team. So we have, other, we have lots of other organizations now that are coming in they are like, hey, we, we heard about this, this cool internal chat mechanism that you guys are using. Um, you know, can we use that too? We're tired of using Link or Jabber or whatever. Um, and same with some of the other tooling. And so that, that's one aspect of, of tool leverage. The other one is um, we've been developing infrastructure monitoring capabilities. Um, so that we can actually uh, operate, support our cloud. So we're, we've been a, a, a big uh, supporter and contributor to Manasca. And we use that to monitor our infrastructure at, at mass scale. And that is actually now going to be rolling out to our customers so they can monitor their instances as well as their applications because they can push custom metric to, metrics into the system. But beyond that, we actually have people in other parts of the company that are running things that aren't ever going to be on our cloud. They're on physical hardware um, for, various, for various reasons. But they, they need the same kind of monitoring, thresholding, notification capabilities, right? They, they don't have to have the rest of OpenStack for that. So they can go and leverage this, this monitoring capability as well. Um, so a lot of leverage going on. Good. So um, yeah, I think just to kind of wrap things up, and we'll open it up for any questions. Um, you know, if you're thinking about putting OpenStack in your enterprise, um, you know, we obviously recommend it. That's what we've done. Um, but I do think it's important to pay attention to the cultural implications that are going to come with that. And, uh, and that's going to mean you're going to have to be appreciative of the kind of customers you're inheriting and what they're going to need. Uh, and, and, then, and then also, and, and Jason mentioned some of those, one of the really cool things that happens is that the tooling and the methodologies and the mindset that you're DevOps OpenStack team brings starts to trickle out into the company, right? And it starts to find interesting little uh, ways to infect all these other teams in, in what I think is a positive way. So um, just to mention, you know, changing the technology, we're all, I think we're all technologists and we like to, you know, wrap our brains around technology and think there's really good problems there. That's really the easy piece. This culture thing is tough. Um, I think you need to have executive backing. Um, and, um, and I think trying to change culture in a company without that, it, it, it's pretty difficult. Um, luckily, we had that. Um, and also, you know, while you're here and while you're making change, and, J and Jason referenced a couple times, you know, we're, we do our, our deployments in the middle of the day, and that's a totally different mindset than the company has. Um, but, but one of the things I'm trying to do is to say, get used to this change, right? Change is the new default culture. We're going faster. And I alluded to this earlier, right? To build, there's this notion that we should be stable over quickness. And, and, and what I'm trying to teach people is that's kind of the opposite way to look at it. You really get stable when you're fast. And so change is really the default culture for us now. Um, we're certainly not done, and there's certainly a lot of corners of time where cable that uh, I think still need, uh, still need some of this, uh, this uh, DevOps mentality to, to infect it. But, um, but I've, been, I've been really happy to see what, what this team has not only accomplished, but, but how that started to really change things at the company. Um, so that's it. We'll, uh, we'll stop there and uh, ask if you have any questions. You stand to a mic. If you can't do that, I'll try and repeat the question and we'll leave it at that. Just want to ask how you funded this. <clears throat> how did you get the CapEx? How did you get the approval to move forward? These kind of initiatives are hard to fund. 
I didn't quite get the how, question. How did you get your funding lined up? How did I get my funding? And CapEx, and how did you make a business case, or did you make a business case? Yeah, so uh, so I I stepped into uh, I stepped into this role um, with some of that business case already having been made, um, and so we had the CTO behind the idea that this is something we should do. The funding piece of it itself was a little more interesting. I I I, I came into this, and maybe maybe this isn't too unfamiliar to some of you, but you know, as a team of one. Um, and I had to go steal my budget from a lot of people who surprisingly aren't really willing to give you a budget. Um, so, you know, I kept repeating the name of our CTO a lot and, uh, and you know, I managed to cobble together money. You know, frankly, a lot of it is just, you know, uh, it's just, um, it, it's not as expensive as you think to, I think, to also put this together. Um, it, you, can, you can get an early, an early version of something together um, for a, you know a pretty small fraction of, of a typical uh, capex budget at uh, at a company like Time Warner Cable. And by the way, there's a there's a panel at 4:30, I think, that is also going to be talking about business uh, drivers and um, and some of the ROI and the other considerations. I'll be on that along with some folks from DreamWorks and some other people. So uh, so I encourage you to to bring some of those questions there as well. You mentioned the carrots and how you're starting to do the show or the you know, chargebacks almost essentially to the different uh, internal teams that maybe are moving things onto your uh, OpenStack cloud. Was that one of the early carrots or like what was the motivation internally for like your first one or two big internal wins of getting something onto OpenStack? Were they looking at it like, okay, I'm able to save some huge internal costs by moving onto this? Or if you don't have any chargeback or anything else, what was that other prime motivator to have your first couple of, you know, big wins? So the, uh, the, sh the showback wasn't really a, a carrot, it was a stick. Um, well, it, it, it can at least turn into that when we actually have actual chargeback, right? Um, the showback, though, did provide insight um, to the teams on, on what their actually utilization was and the uptake. And I think the other part of your question was about how to get the first few uh, big projects going. Um, I, that, was, that was actually not too hard. I mean, we had, there's, there were some people that were clamoring for resources. So there's, uh, in some of our data centers, there's dwindling, resor there's dwindling resources. Like, there's just no more like, hardware or space available, right? Um, and we had set up a lot of capacity for a cloud, right? And it was just like, there it is, like you can go have it, right? So it was real easy for them, like, oh, we can just kind of go use that, right? So it was, it was the availability, really, and then kind of all the other value adds that, that uh, really got people jumping on it. Yep. Hi. Um, from a shifting culture perspective, which is more important, building the cloud or having the cloud? And if you had to go back and do it again, would you build your own again, or would you partner with, with someone to provide you a cloud? So that's a good question. I'll, I'll, I'll get Jason's take on it, too. My, mine is that, um, and, and, and by the way, at Time Warner Cable, this isn't our only cloud technology, right? So we, we actually have other, other elements of technologies to support that, that are under what I'll call cloud. Um, what I will say is, and, and, and what we tried to talk about a little bit here, was there were some really um, interesting side effects that showed up because we built our own cloud here. Because it was the DevOps team that Jason brought on board that started to operate totally differently and do deployments in mobile day that really freaked people out. Um, and, and it was the tool chain that they brought, and all of a sudden, an app development team that wanted to get a little better at this had a tool chain and a bunch of people knew how to use it that they could just start to use. And so by building a cloud like this, I think it really helped infect the culture a little more than it would have been if we had just parked, you know, backed it up and parked it and said, here's your new cloud. Um, what, what do you think? Yeah, I would agree with that. And to answer the other part of your question, like if we were to do it again, would we build it or partner? I would absolutely build it again. Um, well, right. that's, that's your job, though. Yeah, that, that, that's job security. <laughs> but no, no, really, I mean, the, the reason we decided to build it um, to begin with is because we didn't want vendor lock-in. We wanted, and we wanted to have the flexibility to expose the features and the, and, and the configuration we wanted to. And if we saw something new coming quickly in the community and we wanted to move to it, we could go do it. 
um, because we, we'd have all the CICD in place and we could go and just affect that change ourselves and not have to go work with the distro vendor to say, you know, when are you going to have that in? Oh, it'll be in, you know, six months in the next release or something. So this OpenStack is moving very fast um, and a lot of it's still immature and still kind of figuring itself out. Um, and, and as long as it's, it's in that state, I want to be able to stay as close as I can to Trunk and be able to control my own destiny. So back when you guys formed in 2014, when you formed the OpenStack team, um, what was the composition of that team? And was it comprised of, did you kind of reach outside to get OpenStack skilled people? Or did you uh, allow some of your folks from, say, network engineering or systems engineering to kind of graduate up, even if they didn't necessarily have the skill set to start with? Oh, yeah, it's a good question. So um, you, you've heard the expression, two guys and a dog. Um, this was, this was kind of the start. And like I said before, we started as a team of one. Me, and I'm not very useful, so I quickly needed to go find some useful people. Um, the first place you do start to look often is internally, and we went around and found some really uh, key individuals in the Time Warner Company, and, and I wasn't so concerned about the skills. I knew they didn't have open skill, uh, OpenStack skills, per se, although actually one did. Uh, but, but, um, but, but, but I was more interested in the attitude and you know, was this something that was, was going to be exciting for them, and was this something that they would get engaged with? Y you know, so, so that's a good start, and that's actually where we did start, and there was a, you know, there was a story I told in Paris about how we got started and everything, and, and it, was, uh, you know, it was a bit uh, you know, uh, two guys and a dog at the beginning. But you do have to, you have to recognize, if you're going to do this at this scale at a company like Time Warner Cable, you have to get professional real quick. So, uh, so most of the, most then of the expertise that I have brought, or actually brought Jason in, and Jason has then brought in uh, folks from outside of the company that, uh, that have had open source, open stack uh, kind of experience. And, and I think that's really what's been the accelerant for the company. And yeah, I'll add one other thing. So we have a, you know, we, we've been striving for DevOps, right? And so we, we have a good mix of very, very strong like software developers. That was kind of the realm they came from, all they did. And then we had some really good operations folks. And I've really, you know, you know I've really been moving both of those sides of the spectrum to the middle so they can actually mesh. Um, and I think that's really what you need. Yeah. So just one quick follow up to that. So have you run into any challenges with this kind of newly formed OpenStack team and your traditional infrastructure teams? And if so, how did you guys overcome any of those kind of, there's so much dovetail there and you know, you've got two teams potentially trying to dictate from an infrastructure standpoint the, you know, the future. Um, yeah, so, so from my perspective, you know, it's not so much trying to dictate the future. What we're trying to make sure, you know, so I'm responsible for the infrastructure for the company, whether it's the subscriber side or the well, the sort of the classic IT side. Um, what it really comes down to is just the realization that there's no one right answer for everybody, right? What 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 somebody who on the IT side of the house needs to host a off-the-shelf Windows application looks a lot different potentially than you know the, the team standing up TWC.com and. And, and so the approach really is provide what the, my customers need. OpenStack was kind of a really new piece of it, right? There was nothing at the company. We had bare metal and, and, and lots of networking. We had virtualization technologies and, and things that started to approach cloud. We had nothing that looked like elastic programmatic infrastructure. Right? It just wasn't there. So that was the gaping hole that OpenStack had to come in and fill. So now when you look at our portfolio, I can take any customer in the company, whether they're doing services for you know, 5 million subs or whether it's, you know, it's a back office IT application, and we can kind of slot them correctly into the cloud architecture. What's really important, though, is that everything start to behave like this service model, not, you know, I want a bare metal box. Please go rack it up for me. Right? So, so that's really the, the, the sort of transition. So I, I don't think it's quite as competitive as, as that. Um, and, and so all the rest of the folks we have you know, are still busy. They still all have jobs to get done. There's, there's a lot going on. The OpenStack was really additive. Was there any compromise on the performance or stability uh, of uh, the applications that moved to the cloud, um, considering, let's say, network implementation and the software versus hardware? 
Uh, and a second question, do you have any issues uh, integrating uh, cloud applications with existing legacy applications that are not so uh, greenfield friendly? So um, I think the first part of your question was about did, did, have we seen any kind of performance limitations? Um, we have, people ask all the time, what are your workloads? And I'm like, well, we, we have like everything. So we didn't, we didn't build um, sp specific to one workload. Um, we, we are general purpose. And so we have people running traditional kind of, you know, web property type stuff in there. We've got people running the video app application backend systems, TWC um, TV, which is our, our, our uh, video of our IP system, um, has all, a lot of its components on there. We've got people running just typical dev test. We have, some, we have somebody running Splunk, a huge Splunk cluster on there. Um, <clears throat> all those customers to date have been very satisfied with it. Now, I can guarantee you we have, we have things running at Time Warner Cable that will not run today on, on that, in that environment. I think they will run into um, some performance issues, some of, the, some of the encoding systems and things like that, especially the real-time related, related things. So we are, um, we are open for business for any workload that wants to go on there, and we, and we do want to have feedback on kind of their experience so we can tune and provide um, the type of performance they want. We can, change, we, we can certainly change things, right? So, but to date, we haven't really had any real performance um, issues. And I think the other part of the question was con network connectivity into kind of back office systems, was that, or uh, legacy systems? Um, one of the things that we did at Time Warner Cable, because we, we, spin, we wanted customers obviously be, be able to spin up an instance very quickly, right? But we didn't want them to then get stuck waiting um, multiple weeks for um, someone in, in networking on the firewall team to open ports, because um, it kind of defeats the purpose of being fast on and spinning things up. So um, we've tried to work with the networking teams to kind of open up everything, all the, all the Time Warner Cable backend systems, to the OpenStack environment. There should be um, open connectivity, and so the customers themselves can control access with security group rules. Um, now, that's, that's, so there's access into OpenStack, but you don't always have the access back from OpenStack into some of those legacy applications, because they do have firewalls in front of them. Um, so th there are instances or, where they do, our customers do need to just kind of work with the, the security teams to kind of get that, those ports open and things like that. So, that's, that's, there's still a little time lag with that. Yep, 